Welcome to Spirits Podcast, a boozy dive into mythology, legends, and folklore. Every week we pour a drink and learn about a new story from around the world. I'm Amanda. And I'm Julia. And this is episode 208, Beowulf with Maria Devana Headley. Amanda, you need to redo the intro because you need to say your full title. <laughs> oh, Julia, don't embarrass me. First, I go on vacation for a week mm. uh, and and then I swing back and I'm like, oh, hello, I am 30 under 30 media luminary, Amanda McLaughlin. Yes, that's correct. And we should say it every time. <laughs> Uh, I mean, shout out to Morgan Jerkins, shout out to Jarvis, our friend and sad boy, uh, shout out to Molly Ostertag, several of my friends and people I admire, uh, in Morgan's case, we're not friends, but I'd love to be, <laughs> who are also on the Forbes list. It is fully meaningless, guys. I, I put money in my savings account for the first time in more than two years today. Um, so it doesn't it doesn't equate to rich and fame and all that stuff. But uh, it is it is quite nice. And I, I hope that everybody is, uh, I don't know, as amazed as I am that the word multitude is in Forbes. <laughs> I'm just going to put a shiny crown upon your head. It doesn't mean anything, but it looks Thank nice. Thank you. Thank you so much. <laughs> I uh, I got I saw it on the internet about 10 minutes before I had to take a COVID test. Um, and now I'm here. So it's been a whirlwind of a morning. Yes, it really has. But let's talk about our new episode. That's right. I was I'm also this should be the highlight of the week. <laughs> because I saw screenshots on Twitter, as I'm sure many of you did a few months ago about a Beowulf translation that uses the word bro, which is incredibly fun and wonderful, and actually beautiful and evocative and tragic and lovely and smart. And so I shot my shot and emailed uh, Maria's publicist and she got back to me. So we got to talk with Maria all about her translation of Beowulf, about the work of translation in general, what the heck this text is, because I didn't, I haven't actually read it before. And so I was like, wait, is this uh, just about like peasants and stuff? And she's like, no, it's like an ancient tale of kings. Mm -hmm. And it was wonderful. Yes, I'm very, very excited. We had such a fun conversation with Maria and I would have her on the show or have a drink with her any day. Absolutely. That's definitely the test we put um, to our guests is like, would we have a drink and have you back? And she passes with flying colors. Just like our new patrons, Amanda, Skylar and Marie. Welcome, guys. You join the ranks of our supporting producer level patrons, Alicia, Allison, Deborah, Hannah, Jen, Jessica, Keegan, Measelkins, Landon, Liz, Megan Linger, Megan Moon, Phil Fresh, Polly, Riley, Sarah, and Skyla. As well as our legend level patrons, Audra, Drew, Francis, Jack Marie, Kai, Lada, Mark, Morgan, Necrofancy, Renegade, and BME. Up, Scotty. Thank you all for using your hard earned human dollars to support us on Patreon as the, you know, making money as an independent person in media is absolutely terrifying and challenging. And the only reason that we're able to be podcasters full time is because of your support on Patreon. So we really, really appreciate it. Or your hard earned cryptid dollars. I don't know who you are. True. That's true. That's true. Amanda, what have you been reading, watching, listening to lately? I feel like I've been hogging the recommendations lately the past two weeks. <laughs> Well, thank you for uh, for coming through uh, for me so I could take a week offline, um, which was amazing. And part of that week, I spent rereading a book by one of my favorite authors, Hanif Abdurraqib, who wrote a book called Go Ahead in the Rain, Notes to a Tribe Called Quest. Ooh. And the reason I reread this wonderful book, which is about Hanif's personal relationship with the music of A Tribe Called Quest and its influence on culture, is because in my 90s playlist, the show that Multitude produced in partnership with Sony Music, we did an absolutely wonderful episode on tribe. And Hanif was our guest. I could listen to him talk for hours and hours and hours about this band. But instead, you can listen to the audiobook or read this book because it's fantastic. Everything he writes is an absolutely brilliant mix of poetry, analysis, memoir, and like personal relationship to the material. And just, I don't know, a way of viewing subject matter in the world that I think will really, really stick with you. So check out Hanif's works on our list of all of our book recommendations, spiritspodcast.com slash books. And speaking of my 90s playlist, hey, you know Multitude makes a bunch of shows, a multitude of shows, one would say? We do. Julia, remind us about some of those shows. Ooh, let me see. What do I want to recommend? I have been absolutely loving Mike's new season of Meddling Adults. I'm very jealous that I keep getting Encyclopedia Brown when I could be getting Scooby-Doo, which I feel like I would master. Yeah. But They're very, if you very good. like children's mysteries and you like uh, feeling smart about solving children's mysteries or being stumped by children's mysteries, Meddling Adults is a great show and they just finished up their second season. I've also been loving Exolore, which is the podcast by Moya McTeer, who you heard in our absolutely fantastic I Thought Advice from Folklore episode last week. And if you want to hear Moya every other week uh, talking about fantastic new worlds, wonderful guests, reviewing worlds that are already out there, and many other kinds of fascinating intersections of science and storytelling. Check out Exolore today. Yes, I was on an episode, not to plug my own stuff, but I had a great time. And I think if you want an entry point that has a familiar voice besides Moya, 
you can listen to that one. And of course, if you just put the word multitude into your podcast player, all of the shows we make will come up. Uh, Horse, Potter List, Next Stop, Waystation, uh, Rip, Join the Party, and Yours Truly Spirits. So please enjoy. And uh, thank you for, for doing your part. If you can't contribute to us financially, which we totally understand, a really, really good way to support Multitude is to recommend shows to your friends. So recommending a, uh, a show that you think your friends in particular would enjoy is a great way to go ahead and support us. And speaking of ways you can contribute to Spirits, you can contribute your urban legends. We're looking to do something really exciting for January. So if you have written in a urban legend and you have a follow-up for that, we would love to hear from you, hopefully before the first week of January. Yeah, if you could get back to us sometime in the next two or three weeks with an update and what has happened since you wrote in, that could include if we haven't read your urban legend yet, you can write back and say, oh, hey, I wrote in about X, Y, and Z, and this is an update because we want to circle back. We want to give you some updates. We want to do the thing I love, which is where a story that you heard has a new or a definitive ending. And we're trying to bring you a, a whole bunch of those very satisfying stories. So hit us up. Go to spiritspodcast.com slash contact, where you can also leave us questions for advice from folklore and uh, suggest episodes or movies for us to do. Everything you need, spiritspodcast.com slash contact. Send us stories. Well, we hope you enjoy this ancient story of Beowulf. So without further ado, enjoy Spirits Podcast episode 208, Beowulf with Maria Devana Headley. We are so delighted to welcome our our bro. I feel like we're going to be bros at the end of this conversation. <laughs> Maria Devana Headley, who wrote an absolutely fantastic translation of Beowulf that just came out. She's also the number one New York Times bestselling author of novels like The Mere Wife, Magonia, Airy, Queen of Kings, and the Memoir of the Year of Yes. Welcome, Maria, to the show. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you for having me on. It is our pleasure. I'm very excited. As someone who, like studied a lot of mythology and a lot of history and stuff. I will admit Beowulf is not my specialty. So I'm really excited that we brought on an expert to talk about it. I love that. I think Beowulf, I also had studied a lot of mythology and folklore and Beowulf kind of goes off to the side of much of what I personally had studied and much of what is sort of in that in that category for a lot of people. So it's been really fun to try something totally different and new and in a different language. <laughs> Great. And can you, for, for the many of us who never read Beowulf, can you explain what the story is and what the poem is? Yes. Um, Beowulf is a story about a, a sort of fancy court that's attacked by a monster. A, a big hall is built. A monster lives nearby. He's already there. He's like, I can't stand it. You're so loud. And he goes at the hall and starts killing people every night. For 12 years, he kills people every night. And this is King Hrothgar's hall. And News spreads all around the world, and this young warrior named Beowulf hears about it and comes to be their monster killer. Lots of people try. And Beowulf comes and kills their monster and gets lots of gold, and everybody thinks he's awesome. And then in the night, after the big celebration of him killing Grendel, the monster, Grendel's mother shows up as a bad surprise. Nobody realizes that Grendel's mother is hardcore. And so she comes and takes one of a sort of revenge one guy kills him and then the next day beowulf goes and comes after her goes into her own hall and he wins ultimately and then goes forth and 50 years pass we have a 50 year time jump and we have an old man beowulf who goes to fight a big dragon that's been battling against his his country which is he's a git so he's, he's swedish um his situation is Old man king wants to fight by himself. He goes and fights the dragon and the dragon kills him and he kills the dragon at the same time. And that's the end of the story. That's what Beowulf is about. It's an old English poem. It's about a thousand plus years old um, in terms of the, when it was written down. It exists probably before it was written down. It was written between like in, in about the early 10th century, but it was, I'm sorry, 11th century and uh, probably exists in a sort of considered way, maybe from an oral tradition, um, up to like three centuries before that. Amazing. So people would experience this as a thing that was recited to them over the course of multiple nights? Well, I think that's what the poem lends itself to. It's it's 3,182 lines. It's a big chunk of time. It's like a, you know, a four hour ish reading and maybe longer if you're talking about drunk reading. <laughs> um, we don't really know. We don't know. There's one manuscript of the poem. It just exists in one copy. 
and we don't know what its history really is. So there is lots of debate about whether it's an oral, a poem that came from a full-on oral tradition and it was around the campfire and around the mead hall, or whether it was just invented by monks in a scriptorium, which I think is unlikely, but that I have to say that that thought does exist for a lot of people. They, they like the sort of distinguished nature of that thought. And I like the dirty nature of the Mead Hall version myself. And that's what this translation uh, that I've done is, is kind of based on an idea like that. Listen, I know Grendel is supposed to be the bad guy, but as a person who has lived near bars before, I understand. I get it. <laughs> right? It's like living upstairs from a bar that's just loud and everybody's singing inside of it all the time like it's bad it's bad news you want it done not a good time not a good time for anyone i feel like i had this thing in my head conflating beowulf and the canterbury tales in some way Mm. and Mm -hmm. they are as different as two things could be it sounds (laughs) they're really different (laughs) yeah uh (laughs) and you write too in your introduction which i i love an, an introduction to a book and i feel like yours was particularly great in helping me understand like where beowulf translations have come from and like where yours is situated in currently. Um, So can you tell us a little bit about the language of the poem and sort of how different folks have approached it in translation and how you've translated this version? The the original language is Old English, which is really different from contemporary English. It's not something that most of us can just, well, none of us can really just sit down and read it. It's not like that. Um, It's a language in which words even that look like some of our contemporary words don't mean the same thing. So it's, um, but you can kind of get a feeling for it if you you look at the old English. But it tends to be a language in which a lot of the words have like a dozen possible meanings. So when you're translating, you kind of, or if you're me, you open up a dictionary and then another dictionary and then another dictionary because the nature of the process of this poem being translated into English over the past 200-ish years, since about 1820, is a very patriarchal tradition of translation. Mm, mm. And there's a lot of, I think, narrow perspective when we're talking about what these dictionaries represent as far as what a word might mean. Frequently, only a small series of possibilities have been offered. So there's lots of scholarship about a lot of this. There are also newer Old English dictionaries, and I read them all at the same time. I, I, I'm, not a, I'm not a scholar. I'm a novelist. So I came from doing an adaptation of Beowulf, which is called The Mere Wife, um, which I started working on ish like 2014, 2015. And it's a modernized contemporary Beowulf. And I thought, okay, I will just go wild. I did as many wild things as I could with the, with this content of the original poem and the content of what people have thought about the poem over the past 200 years. But when I was doing the translation, I was really thinking hard about what the history of translation of this poem has been. The, the 200, 300 other translations, I read a ton of them because I was curious about the impact the poem has had on our culture today. So this is a translation that is as much about reception as it is about what it really says. There's like a literal way of translating Beowulf, and people have done that. There are plenty of literal translations. There's also like a way where you try to mimic the Anglo-Saxon meter and alliteration and rhyme Mm -hmm. and do it accurately, quote unquote. And that is often messy because it doesn't really work in contemporary English. Um, I did a version that is a very full of alliteration, full of rhyme. I wanted it to feel like a text that you could shout out right now over a loud bar full of people, but it has archaic words in it. It also has contemporary slang in it. It has slang from the past 600 years of using English, which is a lot of our language is slang. And I think people don't necessarily realize how much of our language is language is slang because it, it just has gotten absorbed into the grabby, grabby English language. Yeah, that that was that was a wild, large compendium <laughs> statement about yeah how I did this, but uh, I did it in a very messy, crazy way. Basically, I just was surrounded by piles of books for two years and and gobbling information from all of them, and then sort of translating it through myself. Who you know, I mean, through the person that I am and what I'm interested in. I'm interested in the female characters. I'm interested in equality. I'm interested in ways of discussing masculinity, which is part of why I was interested in doing this to begin with. Well, you came to the right podcast to talk about that kind of stuff. Absolutely. Yeah. And I, I think a lot of our um, our audience probably heard about your book through 
a wonderful screenshot of a passage including the word bro um, on Twitter. So can you tell us a little bit about, I don't know how to pronounce the the old English word, but the the word that various people have, have said like hark, so, and you thought that bro, and I agree, is a fantastic uh, way to translate that. <laughs> like that. So the first word of Beowulf is a word that is that is called what, and it's it's sort of pronounced like cat and what combined to eat with each other. It is a word that nobody really knows what it actually means. It's it's the only place it occurs is at the beginning of Beowulf, and oh. it yes. So it's been translated many different ways. It's been translated as hark or as low or as so by Seamus Heaney very famously. And uh, I decided to translate it as bro. It's the kind of word that you use to say, shut up, I'm talking, I'm going to tell you a story. And I feel like for the past 20 or so years of, of the English language in America, specifically, bro is a word that you might use for that. Although I struggled a lot with wanting it to be bros because he's clearly talking to a crowd, but bros isn't the right, isn't a word that we use. So I said, okay, fine, fine, uh, bro singular. Um, but bro singular pains me because I'm like, the collective noun for a group of bros doesn't really exist and should exist. And I don't know what it, what it should be, but you're welcome to, uh, to consider that possibility. <laughs> That's what I wanted. I think if you're trying to get the attention of several bros at once, just saying bro will make all of them turn their heads. So I feel like you're in a good place there. I agree. I mean, it's definitely a word that implies familiarity and it also implies a fraternal relationship. It implies a lot of things. I, it's, it's interesting working on it because people, some many people don't love that I did this, right? This is a this is a choice that is transgressive, <laughs> but it's a choice that a lot of people who've studied old English are like, well, that's about right. That's what it means. It means, you know, it's a it's a slamming your beer down on the bar and saying, I'm I'm about to tell you something major. But it's it's been discussed quite a bit because people feel like it's not dignified enough. And that's an interesting art. Um, artifact of some of the previous translations, which had in them a kind of tone of, in the days of kings, we did it like this, and it was so dignified and noble. And that reflects much more on the lots of the very famous previous translators than it does on what's actually in the poem itself. It isn't necessarily about glorious no noble masculinity it's it's a lot of it is about dirty masculinity <laughs> yeah exactly and like also who says it has to be noble and like uptight and stuff like that like this does feel like the story of beowulf does feel like a story that you would tell like around with your friends while getting drunk i i'm in my mind picturing like a bunch of bros at a boston bar talking about the shit tom brady got into over the past couple of months during the off season yeah exactly that's that's absolutely what I intended it to be. I wanted it to feel like this is a guy who is famous and we don't quite know him, but we feel like he's our guy, Beowulf. And uh, I was looking for something that would give us that tone so that you could speak, the narrator could speak with affection of this hero, but the hero is one of us. He's one of our boys, you know? And, and I think we have a way in uh, Western culture of talking about men that way frequently, our boys, our guys, like as as familial when in fact they are not when women don't get talked about this way we don't get talked about as like embraced as one of the family no matter how badly we fuck up that's not something that that there's like language for in the language of, of femininity and english so it's it's an interesting thing the way that beowulf has forgiven his trespasses and forgiven and forgiven and i think a familiar thing to uh contemporary uh, contemporary americans and english speakers around the world and maybe not just english speakers maybe everyone there's definitely forgiveness for masculine fail um, across the board in the world. Yeah. And we have a lot of stories about it, but I don't think we always point at the fact that something is being forgiven. We just point at it as he did something heroic. That's much more important than the, the you know, um, blast radius of the heroic act. Yeah, yeah, that makes a lot of sense. Now I'm thinking about the, like the parasocial relationship between like myth tellers and the focus of their myths. And I got to like think about that more, but that's just a thought <laughs> that is in my head now. Yeah. And I, I think a lot of the project, obviously I'm not an actual historian, but I feel like so much of the project of looking for marginalized um, histories, whether that's of women, of queer people, um, is is a, of negative space and seeing what's not written, what's not said, what was going on that nobody like the whole like who, you know, made Shakespeare's meals, you know, like there's there's a lot yeah. of context around these works that we are not told to look for or that people often mention. Yeah, the 
my whole career has been about investigating the gaps in the history because I have always been really interested in the gaps because I fall into the gaps. <laughs> and uh, I'm like, okay, where, are, since I was a little kid, I was like, where, where's the story of somebody like me? Oh, there isn't a story of somebody like me. Okay. But it must be there. Like, this isn't just lone dude. Like the, I, my world isn't lone dude. So it's, um, it's been an interesting thing to look at who the stories were written about and look at, the people in in the case of Beowulf, there are lots of female characters. They're all over it. Um, but the women, especially in translation, have often been kind of made more normal than they actually are. They're made more acceptable, more like what you would think a wife of a king would be like. When in fact, there's often in the gaps and in in the lines itself, in the subtext of the lines, there's a lot of like power underneath happening, which is something that I've always found really interesting in terms of, of the epics. And if we're talking about the Odyssey, it's there. If we're talking about the Iliad, it's there. It's all over. Like there, there are female characters with their own ambitions throughout all of these projects. And in some cases, you get to see some really interesting activity from those characters. And in, uh, in Beowulf, you do. You see a female warrior who actually fights. But uh, in lots of them, you don't. You don't see the battles. You don't see somebody coming in. And, I mean, it's very interesting to have an intellectual life, but I think intellectual life is hard to depict in yeah. epic poetry and in literature, in everything. It's hard to explain yeah. somebody who's been sitting around thinking, um, even though lots of the work of women changing the world has historically been women sitting around thinking yep. <laughs> yeah, and changing things radically as a result of it. But I think it's hard to depict, especially if you are a narrator and a, or a, a creator who isn't even aware that that's happening which is a lot of the history of literature no, and totally. the present. <laughs> We're still there. Yes, absolutely. And I remember too, in, you know, like English literature classes, learning about how when the novels came about as a phenomenon, uh, men in power were like, ah, don't read these, they're going to give you ideas. Because for arguably the first time, somebody sitting around thinking was captured and like interiority um, yes. was, was centered. Yeah. We are sponsored this week by Skillshare, and we've talked a lot about Skillshare and learning new skills and taking these online courses, but have you considered, have you considered getting your friend for the holiday season a class from Skillshare or a whole month from Skillshare? If I was doing that, let's say, uh, for, for a friend of mine who happens to do a, a folklore podcast with uh, her companion from the cradle, Aww. if I were doing that, I would maybe recommend this class, which is Plants at Home, Uplift Your Spirit and Your Space by Christopher Griffin, because maybe this person really likes plants and does a really good job of taking care of those plants, but maybe could use a few more tips. And Christopher Griffin has this incredible, just like over 160 plants in their apartment, and they run an incredible Instagram account called Plant Queen, and they just share their love of plants as a tool for finding community and creativity and calm in an otherwise nonstop world. And it is honestly such a good introduction class for Skillshare that I would I would 100% send that someone's way. It's a great recommendation, Julia, and I would love this class. I really love um, Christopher's sort of focus on plant care as self-care and something that isn't stressful or, you know, self-judgmental, but instead a way to like connect with, you know, your environment and to make your home really homey. So it's a great recommendation. And so is recommendation of Skillshare. I think it's a great kind of mix of a practical gift, but a gift that's also a gift and not like a new toilet brush or whatever, mm -hmm. uh, which I did just a gift to myself, which was great. An experience gift, which I think are a lot of times way better than a physical gift. And conspirators, if you go to Skillshare.com slash spirits and you're one of the first thousand people to use this link, you will get a free trial of Skillshare premium membership for you to gift or to uh, look at and kind of experience yourself. Yeah, so you can explore your creativity at Skillshare.com slash spirits. And if you're one of the first thousand people to use our link, you will get a free trial of Skillshare premium membership. This is a great gift for the holidays. It is also a great gift to give yourself new knowledge. Very important. Thanks, Skillshare. Speaking of plant queen, one of the things that they talk about that I love the most is the fact that like not every plant is good for every house or every person. And there is something that, you know, will work for you particularly in your particular space. And that is totally true of personal care products as well. And today's second sponsor, Function of Beauty, is absolutely a great way to get customized hair care that is just for you. They have a quick but thorough quiz where you tell them about your hair goals, your hair type, if you, you know, are looking for support or a kind of product in one way or another. Um, and you can even choose the 
color of the bottle and the product and a fragrance as well as the strength of fragrance, which we all know that I'm a huge fan of. Mm -hmm. Then their team determines the right mix of ingredients and bottles your custom formula to order. It comes to your door in a very cute customized bottle, uh, cardboard packaging, very light on plastic, which I love, along with pumps for the bottle, stickers, gifts, even a detailed instructions card so you can get used to your new hair care regimen. And what I really like about Function of Beauty is that they use only clean ingredients. All of their formulas are vegan and cruelty free, and they never use sulfates or parabens or any other harmful ingredients. And, you know, they're quality stuff. They have over 50,000 real five star reviews and counting. So you know that what is working for other people will probably work for you too. So what are you waiting for, guys? Go to functionofbeauty.com slash spirits to take your quiz and save 20% on your first hair care order. That is functionofbeauty.com slash spirits to let them know that you heard about it from us and to get 20% off your hair care order. That's functionofbeauty.com slash spirits. And finally, we are sponsored by Away, which creates thoughtful products designed to change how you see the world. They started, of course, with a suitcase that may be how you know them. They have features that make travel more seamless with that. But now, even when the familiar looks very different to how it used to, you can count on their range of essentials to solve real travel problems whenever you do take that next trip. Back in February, we took a trip as a as a team. We went to Austin for a live show and then to Houston for Mike's wedding. And I had to pack everything in a carry-on to have a merch table at that live show, to have an outfit for the live show, to drive across Texas, and then to attend a wedding, as well as plain clothes to like be comfortable while traveling. And there was a lot to fit in there, but I use an away suitcase. I absolutely love it. I'm a huge suitcase um, connoisseur. I have used a lot of <laughs> luggage and I have very strong opinions about what's good and what's not. And what I love the most is that away is durable. I once packed a full cooler of locks in it and uh, nothing got damaged, which was great. And they have an interior organization system, including a compression pad to help you pack more and a hidden removable laundry bag, which is so clutch on trips, that especially multi-destination, to pack your dirty clothes. That is such a huge, like, why Why is not every bag doing that? I don't know, but they should because Away is wonderful. They're designed to last a lifetime. They have a customer service team that will arrange to have it fixed or replaced if any part of your suitcase breaks, which is incredible. And there's a 100-day trial on everything they make. Use the product, take it out, test it, try it. And if you don't like it, you can return any non-personalized item for a full refund. No questions asked. And Away offers free shipping and returns on any order within the contiguous U.S., Europe, Canada, and Australia. So you can shop their selection of suitcases and bags at awaytravel.com slash spirits and gift someone something to look forward to this holiday season. That's awaytravel.com slash spirits. And now let's get back to the show. Can you tell us about some of these amazing women of the book Beowulf? I hate that it's the guy's name, the, the, the epic of Beowulf. Can you tell us something about these awesome women? I can. And interestingly, Beowulf isn't even titled Beowulf um, in the original manuscript. It doesn't have a title. It You would not know. I mean, somebody at some point along the way was like, I mean, Beowulf, there's a lot of Beowulf in here. I guess we're going to call it Beowulf. But you could as easily call it Hrothgar or you could call it Problems with a Dragon or, you know, there's there's plenty of room for different titles. It's It was just a sort of decision of, of scholars and, and dudes. It was a decision of dudes. So Beowulf is called that for that reason. Um, and I had to call it that because then otherwise no one would have known what I was talking about. For searchability. Mirror wife. That's why. <laughs> so the women of Beowulf are a pretty amazing group. They are Grendel's mother, who is a warrior queen. In my translation, she that's what I translate her as. Um, lots of previous translators translated her as a monster hag. That's something I've talked about quite a lot surrounding this. And it's one of the reasons I decided to do a translation, although not all translators translate her that way. And there's tons of scholarship from people going, no, she's really more like a Valkyrie or she's like, she's, she's not, there are no words that signify that she's a monster, but it's also very tempting to have her be a monster, especially because her son is, her son is described monstrously, but her, the father of her son is not even mentioned. So, I mean, he's mentioned as who is his father? Meh, we don't know. <laughs> So yeah, so is she a monster? I think she's not. I think she's a female warrior who's been the queen of her own kingdom, which looks different from Hrothgar's, for as long as Hrothgar has been king, which is 50 years. So she's an older woman who's a fighter. And she has a big armory of stuff. She's got swords. She has all kinds of gold. She's got all kinds of stuff, which presumably because there's no mention of her stealing it from anyone, and there is elsewhere in the text if something like that is revealed, it's hers. She won it. Um, or inherited it, but it's like, it belongs to her. She's not a thief. 
So wow. she's a really interesting character. She has Grendel, who's her son, who is super sensitive. She sensitive and has bad judgment. Very relatable. She's a single mother with a difficult child. And so we have her. We have Will Thiel, who is Hrothgar's wife. And she is like the peace weaver. The main mentioned peace weaver within the text of the poem. She does a lot of, she she actually speaks. She's, um, I think she's the only woman that speaks in the poem because Grendel's mother doesn't speak and doesn't have a name. But Will Thiel does. She gives a speech. She gives a speech about to Beowulf saying, welcome, come here. Yeah, I'm going to give you some gold. Here's your stuff. Rewards, rewards. Don't cross me. I will have you killed. And that's all in the subtext, but I think it's right there. She's like, everyone in this hall is loyal to me. Don't do me wrong. If you do me wrong, if there will be problems for you. If you do me right, you'll get a lot of gold. Um, mm-hmm. Keep on with it. Do me right. So there's that. There is um, Modthrith, who is a woman who's frequently cut from Beowulf. She is a woman who's really angry. She is a daughter of a king. She has men executed if they look at her. You would imagine there's a reason for that, right? Like, I I think that the reason is not given. She's just crazy. But, you know, living as a woman this long, 43 years, I'm like, "Eh, she probably had a reason. Like, it's not... It's not just a chill thing to have a bunch of dudes killed. And she suddenly gets better when she leaves home. I wonder why, what was wrong. Uh, So she gets better. She gets married. All is well now. It's mysterious. She's like so nice now. Um, We have her. And she's sometimes described as a creature in the scholarship. Grendel's mother and Montreff are sometimes together, the two monsters, the female monsters, Um, even though she's clearly human. Yeah, they're just like, they're, they're women who lived old enough to have done things other than be someone's like daughter or wife and it's it's so oh my gosh i can't get over i can't get over the like monster hag uh designation yeah yeah it's amazing i mean and this dates i mean Seamus Heaney did it he he called her a monster hag exuberantly and hell bride like he he added some extra of his own because he was like into the idea you know and the idea is interesting female monsters interesting but we certainly I mean, as women, we also know a lot about being a female monster, and I think most of us do. So I wasn't originally interested in Grendel's mother because she was a monster. I thought, oh, she's powerful. But now I think it's more interesting to not be a monster and to be battling against that designation within your culture. But it's also the women always fall into like one of two categories when they are a monster. It's either the succubus or the crone, and you always keep running into those same dynamics every time, and it just gets boring after a while, to be quite honest. Yeah, it's boring. And um, Emily Wilson talks about the designation of Calypso and Circe as uh, as witches when the word that represents them is actually goddess, Mm -hmm. you know, and just translation. Like people are like, you know, what makes a lot more sense to me is that this is a very bad person. But goddesses are often really precarious in their impulse across the board in literature as are gods as we well know the gods just spend all their time raping yeah they do <laughs> they really do and you know i mean the fe- the goddesses don't do as much of the raping but they do do some things that are that are wild card things and it's interesting that in the past few hundred years we just decided that if a woman does something that's a wild card thing that defies the structure of of patriarchy and hierarchy she instantly because she grows scales or she becomes possessed by the devil or, you know, and we have lots of different ways to describe transgression. And most of them are, I mean, frequently they're supernatural, even, even different kinds of hell bitch kind of things, but they're like, often the transgression is just for survival. Mm. And uh, so frequently monsters come out of women who are like, I'm just trying to like have an herb garden and, raise some food for myself and deliver some babies like fuck off leave me alone i'm not a monster um but then you know sometimes you have more power if you say yeah yeah, i'm a monster you better stay back sometimes it's better to embrace that yeah but like i I hate that the idea that if a goddess is like something other than like you know the pure hestia version of the greek gods all of a sudden they are a monster like god forbid these gods (laughs) Haha. <laughs> uh, God forbid these gods actually have like emotions and be like humans and we consider them still gods, you know? The the men can do that, but the goddesses can, and it's beyond frustrating studying mythology. It's so frustrating. And you and you can see the ways that that 
like sort of wide scale consumption of the Bible in translation created a situation where we were like, well, there's only one guy who's really unpredictable and he's in charge and he's really very forgiving and very kind, but has a lot to say about transgression. Like he's a massive transgressor. Like yeah. Book of Job is just all transgression. Um, but I think a lot of the feminine stuff in the Bible got redacted and redacted and redacted yeah. until it became like nice girl or or whore. And you ended up with just like this, these leavings that probably were not, and we know they're not, they're not all that was there. So we ended up with just a, a thing that reflects our society, our troubled, troubled, unequal society that we continue to mythologize and to uh, justify <laughs> with our with our folklore as we continue forward as humans. Yeah, and that kind of like bravado um, is definitely something that I see as like excusing uh, male behavior where you're like, oh, that king, he was so eccentric. Oh, he was so fun. Oh, he had such weird hobbies. Oh, he like, you know, was so unpredictable. And then a, a woman like, you know, renovates the herb garden to be more productive and it's like wasteful i'm talking about michelle <laughs> yeah. obama that's the discourse yeah it was it was a whole thing yeah so i know grendel isn't really, like really particularly described other than being like large and strong and whatnot is there like a sort of mythological equivalent to at least how you picture him or how other interpretations of grendel have pictured him i'm very curious about like the logistics of it well, it's interesting. I think that in terms of how he's described, he's described, yeah, he's described as big. He can like kill 30 at one blow, kind of, as can Beowulf, by the way. So like, that's an interesting parallel between them. And it's mentioned 30. Okay, well, are you human, Beowulf? No. Um, if Grendel's not, you're not. But like, <laughs> I think that the mythological parallels are basically giants. Like he's a... Um, and that kind of character shows up throughout a lot of different, in a lot of different places. Like you see that in Irish mythology from around the same time. You see like the sort of Finn McCool stuff. There's a, there's a giant that is, that likes to sing, puts everybody to bed by singing. So it's kind of the opposite. It's like the reverse turned inside out Grendel, who's like, stop singing. And this one is singing and then kills everybody while they're sleeping, just as Grendel does, which is really similar. Um, yeah, that's, that's what I would, would imagine in my, in, when I was thinking about it, as I was working on Mere Wife, especially, I thought of Grendel as he, he's tall, like, and what I was thinking about with mere wife was the notion of othering uh, your neighbors, the notion of like putting up a wall between your hall, your suburb and the rest of the scary world. And there, everybody out there is bad, but you guys are good inside. And I thought a lot about American race politics in regard to Grendel and his mother in terms of that book. But in terms of the poem itself, translating it, I mean, that stuff is all, it's there. It's there. The notion of like, you are others. You're not from the same culture we're from. We That means you're monsters and very dangerous and we'll kill you. But also we'll kill you in order to arrive at peak masculinity, which is, hey, we're still there. We have not changed. We are mm -hmm. like kill, killing the other in order to arrive at peak masculinity is exactly what we're dealing with in America right now. And we're dealing with like a longstanding tradition of of um, peak masculinity training that arrives at killing the quote monster um, and becoming a hero. <laughs> so, so yeah, that's, um, I don't remember what the question was. I was just thinking about my race. Just descriptions of uh, Grendel and if there were any mythological uh, comparisons, but giant is great. Yeah, that's what it is. Um, and descendant of Cain. That was going to be my next question. <laughs> yes, you get you get all of the, the sort of biblical stuff, which possibly is grafted in by the scribes later mm -hmm. after, like, after it's been written. There's a whole bunch of sort of Christian panic that's like stuck into the poem that's like actually because they're, they're not talking about a Christian society. The poem is about a pagan society. Um, so there's like a lot of and, you know, it's Cain. It's Cain. Don't even think about it anymore. It's Cain. Don't worry about it. <laughs> but it talks work. a little bit We're about monks. how everyone who descended from Cain has problems because God doesn't love them. God has banished banished that line. And uh, it's monsters. It's elves. It's gnomes. It's like a whole pile of problems over here. And Grendel has descended from that. That's what it says in the book. We have a saying here on the show, uh, lol, it's not pagan, it's fine, is the uh, full slogan of christianity <laughs> a bunch of monks yes. are at work they're like ah, yes. 
I really want to, if we're going to spend five years writing something down, I feel like this is a fun one, but you know, the bosses are going to want us to put some moral lessons in there. Yeah. There's, there's like a panicky God stamp that shows up periodically (laughs) in the margins and with scribbles, like, and it's, um, yeah, it's monks. (laughs) It's always monks. I feel like we also forget that people in history had entertainment um, and and like told each other's stories for fun. And I, I guess looking back, it's sort of easy to assume that like these, you know, epic tales um, are like historical records. Like we look to them for the purpose of learning about the past. But at the time, like this story is just like for fun. And, and it is, I'm sure, saying a lot about people's morals and society and, and kind of all of that in the way that every story any person tells does. But I, I just love that there is like there is. A hero there is a villain there are time jumps like there is so much in this that makes it a really dynamic story that someone chose to tell and not just kind of like a manuscript we look at for some learning about the evolution of the english language yes i i mean that's what's when i first encountered beowulf i was in high school like most of us were or in early in college and uh, but in america it's taught often in high school so like 10th grade 11th grade and I remember thinking, ooh, ooh, it's going to be exciting. It has a dragon in it, and it has a female warrior. And it, we read a mid-century translation, which wasn't Raffle. It was something possibly chickering. I'm not sure what it was, but it was um, dry. It was very dry. I wanted always, as a reader, to recapture the sense of vigor that happens in like, why would you tell a boring story? Nobody wants to tell a boring story. And uh, no one in the history of humans has ever wanted to tell a boring story. So I was like, okay, like, why would we be adding some baggage of boringness onto the words that are being used here in order to make them seem dignified? Like, why would why would anyone do that? No writer would do that. Like, that's not, um, that's not juicy. And certainly no like stand-up comic would do it, which is kind of the equivalent. Like an oral storyteller in the medieval period is like, wants the audience to be there with him, like, or her. Would be nice if that was the case. Probably less so, but like, we, we dream. But like, you, you want the laughs to land. You want the jokes to hit. You want the choral phrasing to be repeated by the people who are listening to you. So I did a lot of work on this translation to make it juicy like that. Cause I wanted, I mean, not to like add events or do anything like that, but I wanted to add language or use language, not really add, like translate language using the choices I had um, to make it feel like something that you would, you want to turn the page. <laughs> Cause I think it's a, it's an old world page turner, you know, like it's, it's like a juicy, pulpy situation where there's, there are supernatural creatures and lots of armor and periodically like, You get an advertisement for the armor for a while. And like, then somebody's like, here's genealogy.com. Let me like show you my, my chart here. Here's my family tree. Like to me, that feels appropriately like what I just said is a joke, obviously, but that's, that's really what the text is like. It's like, it's full of all the things that it's always been full of, that storytelling has always been full of. And then now we watch it on TV or whatever, but it's the same kind of mode where you want people to keep tuning in. And in also in the text, there are recaps. There's like last night. Grendel showed up and he did some horrible shit. And and like, it's literally right there in the text. It's a long repetition of the battle that we just watched. So I think that's for, you know, it's tonight on Twin Peaks, essentially. Like it's, you know. <laughs> I um I remember talking about the uh about like ancient Greek texts as well where um individual characters will have like that descriptor that is always set in front of them you know like uh proud Odysseus and something mm-hmm. like that and a thing that I loved in in your translation too are those kind of compound words of you know the sky candle or the the uh whale road mm-hmm. can you tell us a little bit about what those are and kind of how you thought about which ones to uh reproduce and which ones to kind of simplify into one word if that happened in your translation yeah they're um those are kennings so those are like yeah they're compound words that are used to just give a poetic spin on something that we already understand like the ocean is the whale road the sky candle is the sun and they're all over beowulf they're also all over all all kinds of english old english poetry um i love them (laughs) they're they're great but often they're pretty repetitive like you'll get 
you'll get the same one over and over again. And so I made it less repetitive. I think um, other people who've done classical translation from ancient Greek, etc., say the same thing. They're like six times a page, there's like a wine dark sea. Okay, we don't necessarily need it six times on this page. And it's the same with Old English. It's like, we don't need that same kenning for Whale Road. We don't, but the beautiful idea of the natural world entwined with the human world is all through old English poetry. And I wanted to keep that. I wanted to, um, I wanted to make us feel the wilderness around us the way that it is felt in the poem. But I made up a whole bunch of new kennings. I like, I stuffed new things in all throughout. So that weren't kennings originally, or that in a little literal translation, there'd be like three different translations in a row somebody attempting to like give you the full spectrum. And sometimes I kept three different things in a row and left them like that, like as a literal translation would rather than a poetic translation. I did a I did a mixed bag of things here. I, I just, I didn't have any like overriding one must in my soul about this. And I think a lot of people have had a one must and they also gave themselves a structure that they couldn't diverge from. Um, and I didn't do that. I was like, if it sounds like I want to do it in this kind of meter, that's what I'm going to do. And if it sounds like I want to have um, extra descriptive passage that's part of a line in a literal translation, I'm going to do it. Because I, the, my goal was just to make it feel, make it clear, make the story clear, make us understand what's going on, which I think probably the original audience would have understood. They're not like lost, but but contemporary audiences listening to Beowulf or reading Beowulf often are really lost. <laughs> even if you're translating it, often you're like, what is happening in this battle? Like, I can't even, I can't understand because you're lost in a kind of lost zone of poetic uh, language that's describing things that would potentially have been known to the original readers slash listeners of to the poem. They would have remembered that history would be known to them, but we don't have it known to us now. So we have to like gently try to make it clear. And I don't have opposition to that. Like I, I some, some translators have been like, it has to feel so weird. The only way we can understand it is, is if it feels archaic and like crazy. We need to understand how different the society is from our society. And uh, I, don't feel that our society is that different from the old English society. I'm like, well, you guys maybe were living at the top end of the society as generally ivory tower translators who were male in the early part of the 20th century. I don't live there. I'm not from there. The, the world actually looks very much like the old English world that is depicted in this poem. We haven't made, we've made a lot of progress in terms of inclusion, but not as much as you would think we would have made over a thousand years. Of, of being pretty aware like that there were problems. We've just consistently rolled the problems away and put them you know, under the building. So yeah, I, I wanted to really point out how, the stuff that was similar rather than the stuff that was different. I didn't think that alienation was actually my, the most desired goal of publishing a new translation of this poem, but, some, but that's not, that's, some people really do think alienation is the goal of publishing a translation of this poem and you know, that's fine. They, those can be read next to this one that I just did. And you can put Tolkien there and you can put Haney there and whatever new translation is potentially going to come out. Like, it's interesting. I think it's all interesting to read it together. But I think that if you want somebody who's 14 to want to read it, and I do, I want the canon to be about self-analysis. I mean, that's kind of the goal. And I think this poem is about self-analysis. It's like, uh-oh, I got masculinity wrong. It happens over and over again in the poem. Like old kings are like, let me remind you of the problems that I had because I thought that I was the man. And I think that's a lesson that we need now as badly as we have ever needed it. <laughs> so, yeah. For sure. A thousand percent. And so often we say this like probably every other episode, but you kind of have to look at stuff sideways. It's helpful to analyze a problem that you deal with in your life or that your bros are going to deal with as you know, you're know you not talking exactly about your woes, but kind of getting at them from the side um, and doing that through a lens of, you know, a tale of kings and monsters um, is is in a way so much easier easier, uh, or at least such an easy starting place um, than kind of trying to dive into those like unknown wilds of of your own inner self. Mm -hmm. 
So you've done a translation of Beowulf. Obviously, you are a fan of mythology, folklore, all that kind of stuff. Now, this is this might be a controversial question since you just finished your translation of Beowulf. Is there another dream project that you would want to translate? I've been really thinking a lot about it. I Good. didn't know that I I didn't know that I loved doing this. I had never done it before. The only thing I'd ever translated was like just a very short poem by an 11th century Spanish poet um, who was tra- was writing in Arabic. And that I I translated just that, just a few lines of it for, for a short story once. So I was like, ooh, that is an interesting thing to do. But doing 3,000 lines of Old English was also really interesting. So yeah, I'm thinking about it. I don't know. I mean, there there's such a large, there's so many texts that have not, have not been looked at through this lens, there are also lots of other women doing this work right now. So I'm I'm delighted by that. I would like the the sort of translation canon to be wider and wider and wider. Obviously, the queering of the canon and the I mean, what I want to say is like anti racifying of the canon, but like it's yeah. I mean, the whole thing is racist, racist, racist. So. I would like to see it not just be all white people doing this work. And there are plenty of people who are not white doing this work, but they're not getting the sort of major translations, which is, and I, the only reason I got it was because I was like white from outside of the, the system. I'm not from an academic background. And that meant that I could publish it with a mainstream publisher, but also all the other reasons that, that, uh, and I'm also white. <laughs> I'm like, I'm all the things, I'm all, I'm all the privileged corner of, of uh, access. Yeah, I have a bunch of dream projects. There are a bunch of things that I would feel that I was not the right translator for, not just because of like me not being fluent in the original language, which plenty of people are not fluent in the original language and they do their work. They're they're like, I'm a poet. I don't have, you know, I, I don't have the ability to translate the inferno from the original, but that's me in the dictionaries. Like, I think it's it's a legitimate means of doing it, if slow. <laughs> uh, so I don't know. I'm looking at this sort of, Stuff that's in the medieval Irish corner that's always been interesting to me. I I love the um I, I mean I love the Finn stuff. I also love all of the Arthurian stuff. There's there's I feel like there's a lot of stuff in the Arthurian canon that's like what <laughs> what is actually happening? And you read it in translation, you're like hmm, that doesn't make any sense at all. And um, I think that's pretty interesting. I, I mean the thing that always attracts me to a project is things not making any sense at all to me. That's the only reason that I do the work I do is that I find something that doesn't make sense and then it makes me itch until I can find a way to make it make sense for myself. So sometimes it's like 10 years of rolling around with hives <laughs> until, I, until I can finally publish the thing that hopefully makes it make sense to me, which is a selfish and weird way to do a career. But like, I don't know, I feel like I'm a four year old in the universe, like all the time who's just roaming around grabbing stuff and going, what is it? Oh, my goodness. <laughs> It's, you know, and it's dinosaur bones. And I'm like, is that a giant human? Is it a, is it a monster? Is it? And that's, um, that's also what's really fun about getting to do projects like this one. Incredible. I love that. I mean, it, it presumes that stuff that exists existed for a reason and it made sense at some point or it, it had a purpose. Um, and mm-hmm. I just I think it's, it's so fun. And I would read your translation of any uh, anything that you wanted. So I'm here. You have, <laughs> you have one buyer. You can tell your publisher you got one for sure. <laughs> That's amazing. (laughs) Well, Maria, thank you so, so much for coming on the show. Can you please let everybody know where they can find you and your books? Yes, uh, you can find me most easily, really most easily on Twitter, which is where I'm Maria Davana, which is D-A-H-V-A-N-A. That's my middle name. Yeah, best place to find me if you want to just hear me talk all day, which is what I do over there about every topic imaginable. But all the topics I've been talking about here are my normal Twitter topics. Um, I also have a website that's just my name. Um, And if you want to buy the book or the books, because there are a whole bunch of them, you can uh, go to most recently to Macmillan, where the Macmillan page has my books. And uh, also kind of any any indie bookstore where they will order my books for you or hunt them down if you can't find them. (laughs) And I think you should also, if you are listening to this, since you're listening to it this way, there's an audio version of this Beowulf, which I think is really good. And it's, I wrote it in order to be both read on the page and to be listened to. So the audio version um, is Macmillan Audio. It is badass. The the guy who did it is, um, his name is J.D. Jackson. Thanks. 
he's just an like audio award-winning badass who went through the poem and um caught all of the rhymes that were hidden in the lines and caught all of the alliteration that was hidden that i put in stealthily inside of syllables so it's um I think it's a pleasure to listen to it and maybe read it at the same time. Incredible. And we will make sure there are links to all of that in the show notes of this episode. Thank you. Amazing. Well, thank you again for joining us. And listeners, remember that if you stumble across your uh, Monster Moms uh, armor hoard, all you got to do is stay creepy, stay cool. Thanks again to our sponsors at Skillshare.com slash spirits. The first thousand people to click that link will get a free trial of Skillshare premium. At functionofbeauty.com slash spirits, you'll get 20% off your first hair care order. And at awaytravel.com slash spirits, you can get something for yourself or send a great gift this holiday season. Spirits was created by Amanda McLaughlin, Julia Shafini, and Eric Schneider, with music by Kevin McLeod and visual design by Allison Wakeman. Keep up with all things creepy and cool by following us at Spirits Podcast on Twitter, Instagram, Facebook, and Tumblr. We also have all of our episode transcripts, guest appearances, and merch on our website, as well as a form to send us your urban legends at spiritspodcast.com. Join our member community on Patreon, patreon.com slash spiritspodcast for all kinds of behind the scenes stuff. Just one dollar gets you access to audio extras with so much more available too. Recipe cards, director's commentaries, exclusive merch, and real physical gifts. We are a founding member of Multitude, a collective of independent audio professionals. If you like spirits, you will love the other shows that live on our website at multitude.productions. And above all else, if you liked what you heard today, please share us with your friends. That is the very best way to help us keep on growing. Thank you so much for listening. Till next time.